How do you like the future? It looks pretty awesome, doesn't it? All right. Good morning. I'm Michael, Michael Gummers, CEO and founder of Frosmo. This third Frosmo X is the Frosmo X17. I'm so happy to see you all guys here. People from 22 different countries, thank you so much for your valuable time arriving here. And of course, all the people from, from Finland. Please cheer to, uh, hey, so, hi to Cheetah. He's there, standing at the back, back of the room. <laughs> Woo! <clears throat> Thanks, Cheetah, for welcoming all the people at the airport. Good job. So I have the privilege for having the first presentation of Frasma X17. And surprisingly, my presentation is about the future of user experience. I have two parts, part one now, and part two has the last presentation of the day. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Wow, you're lucky. I'm going to reveal the future, future to you. So I'm going to talk about first some pretty big disruptions that took place this year in uh, consumer businesses. And what can we learn from those? What can we try to predict from those, how the future of UX will look like? And of course, the second part of the presentation is how we at Frasmo see the next generation user experience. Sounds good? Yeah. All right, let's get to it. So the first company I want to talk about is Amazon. Why? Amazon is poised to be probably, or very likely, the most powerful company in the world. So whatever they do, it's pretty important to try to understand why they do it and what kind of implications will it have. You all probably know this, that Amazon bought the Whole Foods this spring, this summer, nearly $14 billion deal, so not a massive size. Yet Amazon had their own food delivery system, Amazon Fresh, for several years in New York, San Francisco, some of the bigger cities in, in the States and also, I think, in London. So now they bought the Whole Foods. Does it mean that they sort of admit that they failed with food? I don't think so. Very few people actually realize that 40% of Amazon's unit sales are done by third-party merchants. So when Amazon built their fulfillment systems and their delivery systems, they decided they make them so excellent that they can offer it to other companies. And they are so much more effective, so much more better, that more and more companies are choosing Amazon to handle the payments, handle the delivery of the products, collection of those products. And of course, what they've done is they've done it also for cloud. So when Amazon built their database infrastructure, they made it so good that they can offer it to third-party companies. Frosmo runs, for example, on AWS. AWS made $3 billion profit last year. So huge business. So maybe this Whole Foods is a way for Amazon to get the first customer for their new system. So I think they're going to do the same thing next for food. Build it so that anyone can start offering their products using Amazon's system. And why is it so important? Here in Europe, we tend to forget how massively big Amazon is. So they have 43% market share of online sales in the States in retail. 43% for one company, and it's growing. $95 billion in online sales. That's 45 times Nike 
online sales. Food is about 20% of retail spend. We still need to eat. The future isn't that advanced yet. So it's a huge chunk of money which Amazon is going to put through their systems. So how will the world look like when uh, producers choose Amazon instead of their trusted retailer? And why would consumers choose to buy food from Amazon instead of the store they used to use? I think one of the key things what Amazon is doing so excellently well is to have the connection with the customer all the time, and they're trying to make it more and more automatic. There are already 80 million paid Amazon Prime members. Think about it. 80 million people have, had, have paid to have the right to buy from Amazon. Why would they switch to anything else? And on top of that, Amazon is doing brilliantly this Alexa system, these Echo devices. Already 12 million of these devices have been sold, and they just introduced legion of these speakers, starting from $20. So if we really try to distill what Amazon is doing, let's, let's try to put it in the shortest possible form. I think this is what they're building. So first of all, they want to have direct ownership of the customer. And they want to have that all the time. So they want to be on top of the customer's mind all the time. And they want to do it, of course, at the scale that's never seen before in human history. And there's another side to it. They enable this, they make this possible by building technology that sole focus is to minimize production costs. That's about Amazon. Next company I want to talk about is Netflix. Disney said no to Netflix. Think about it. Disney is probably the best content producer company in the world. And they monetize their content through all possible channels, right? So now they're suddenly saying no to Netflix. That's weird, isn't it? Is it saying that Netflix wasn't paying enough to Disney? Well, let's try to think about Netflix a little bit more as a company. It's amazing. They have really been about superior user experience all the way since they started shipping DVDs in mail. They were the first ones to realize streaming will be the next big thing. And when they did that, what did they do? Perfecting the UX. Super easy sign up, subscription, automatic, excellent streaming quality, they put a lot of effort to it, availability all the time, and all devices. They didn't start building their own devices. They had that in, in their strategy, by the way. Roku is founded by Amazon, but they decided it's, it's not the right path. They need to be device agnostic. And of course, all the time they were thinking that they have to build it so that they have zero distribution costs. Zero or very minimal transaction costs. First company to really make TV global. Before Netflix, TV was really local. Netflix makes money from content created by others, and they use this money also to secure exclusive content for them, right? So that, you know, if you want to see this piece of content, you have to subscribe for Netflix. And they're making so much money that they can also buy all other content to their library. So eventually they will have so big library that even people who like really niche content will join Netflix because the value for money is so good. The library is so vast. 
So they have horizontal control over TV content. And that really makes people quit other channels, and especially cable. Disney realized it. If they would have continued offering their content through Netflix, they would eventually have been Netflix prisoner. They would have been one step down the value chain. And funny thing, I made this presentation about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, last Thursday, Disney announced their horizontal uh, online movie service where you can purchase movies. You cannot rent them yet, you cannot subscribe yet, but they started to offer movies from all possible studios. So I guess the only path for Disney is to try to beat Netflix. But if we really distill Netflix into as short possible, as, as, as short form as possible, what do they do? Think about it. Direct ownership of the customer all the time. If you think about TV, you think about Netflix. And at a scale that's never seen before in human history, all around the world. And while they build the technology, how they enable this is with technology that allows them to press down the production costs. Very similar to Amazon, isn't it? From word to word. Third company I want to talk about is Airbnb. Airbnb started to sell something called trips this spring. So basically guided tours. That's pretty awkward, isn't it? You know, guided tours, probably not a very big business. Well, I assume it means that, it can only mean that uh, uh, Airbnb will add flights, their selection, and probably hotels. Why on earth? Why to go into those businesses? Well, think about what Airbnb has built. So, they don't own these rooms, of course, that's obvious. They want to control all the payments. They don't let anyone else sell Airbnb rooms, right? They want to control the payments they collect from the people, and when the, the, the money they pass on to the people who own the rooms. They're really focused on perfecting the user experience. Absolutely no friction for anyone. So I guess Airbnb wants to be the travel solution for people, no matter where they want to travel or which way they want to travel. I guess that's their long-term strategy. And if we really distill Airbnb into a short form as possible, I think it looks like this. So again, direct ownership of the customer all the time at a scale that's never seen before, going global, and enabled again through technology that aims to lower the production cost. The sole focus there, how do we minimize the production costs? So what are these companies? These are, of course, the winner-takes-it-all companies. I don't think it's too late to compete against these guys. So that's why it's so important to try to understand what can we learn from them. And of course, how could we be the winner? Let's take a little bit more in-depth look of the analysis of what defines winner-takes-it-all company. So the first thing is that they create this omnipresent application, sorry, omnipresent relationship with the customer through an application. It doesn't need to be a native application, but, but internet application, a web store, a system that of course works with your mobile phone or whatever devices you have. So this user experience needs to be available everywhere, all the time, with any kind of device. And they really put huge amount of effort to perfect it. And usually, this is how far I think analysis goes when, when people think about these winner-takes-it-all companies. But there's a lot more to it. So the second thing 
is to, for them, is that they, they really ruthlessly figure out the strategy, how to minimize the production costs, or reduce the production cost risk significantly, usually by introducing a new business model like service where they get, or subs subscription fee where they get continuous revenue streams. And then they build the technology around this, to enable this. And the bigger they get, the more companies they can force behind their system. Third really important thing is, which a lot of the companies struggle, is uh, making sure that the transaction costs are minimal and transactions itself are automated and preferably, again, subscription-based. It is so crucial that there is absolutely no friction, not to the end customer, the consumer, or to the companies they work with, with the transaction costs or transactions itself. So these are, I think, the three things that really define what the winner takes it all companies do. Does it sound logical? Yeah. Good, yeah. It's, now when you put it like this, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? We're all thinking about these things. We're all trying to do this. Have they gained so much momentum already? It's impossible for us to catch up. Well, I think something really huge is about to happen which creates us all pretty tremendous opportunities. So, modern consumer. Interacting, we're interacting with the companies we want to buy services and products from already with multiple different devices. And it's quite challenging to create a seamless user experience across all these devices, wouldn't you say? A lot of the companies are struggling with it. Even with these winner-takes-it-all companies, even they're perfecting it so well. And this tiny little watch that people doomed to be a failure, Apple Watch here, a couple of years ago, has now 30 million active users. And they just released the latest version, which has an electronic SIM, so it works as a mobile phone. I predicted last year that probably within the next few years, people won't be carrying these bulky, big smartphones with them because it's actually annoying. So, with that new latest generation Apple Watch, you don't need to carry a small uh, smartphone with you. Especially when you connect it with the wireless uh, AI assistant. And more stuff is, of course, coming. We have the smart TVs, people are interacting more with it. We already spoke about the Alexa, Echo, speakers, smart speakers coming to your home. And I predict, or we predict that in a couple of years, smart glasses will become a mainstream solution. And when it comes, it will be great design, and they will be very lightweight. Not clunky devices like, <laughs> like uh, what we see now with the HoloLens. And of course, to really perfect the UX, the machine learning will help companies to create really personalized experiences for people. And the question with the machine learning and all these artificial intelligent assistance is who really owns those and, and who controls them. So what it this all means, I think, is, is that this is an endless amount of possibilities for us all to create those user experiences that helps us to own the customer, and of course, all the time. So we should embrace this change. It will be as difficult also for these current winner-takes-it-all companies. They will take a lot of the market, but the market is so massive, if we think about it right, I think there are endless amount of these new kind of niches 
global niches, which all are massive in traditional sense. So billion euro niche here and there all the time coming out. And these winner takes it all companies won't have time to tap into all those niches. So that's the opportunity for us. The key is, of course, for us to serve better our customers in that selected niche than the winner takes it all companies. Let's talk a little bit about the future of UX. How, how could we own the customer? How could we create this amazing user experience that, that helps us to provide better service than winner takes it all companies? Let's talk a little bit about augmented reality. So you take your mobile phone out. What you can do is you can choose your diet preference. For example, vegan, gluten-free, high protein. And what you just do is you point your mobile phone towards the products at the store, and it will right away, instantly, tell you with symbols if the product is suitable for your diet or not. So you can just glance quickly the products and see if they're suitable for you or not. The application does it through 3D modeling, so you don't, no one needs to add any kind of labels or stickers to the product itself, but the device reads and understands what the product is and reads the information related to the product from the product feed that's already being created for the web store. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to tell you that you can act experience this application in live today and tomorrow at the Frosmo Tech Lab. So please go there and try it out yourself to see how it works. A little bit of clapping to our tech team. It's very nice, very neat, practical example, but test it out yourself. Let's take it a little bit further to the future. So I spoke about these glasses, and I'm a high believer that that's going to happen in, within the next few years. So again, what you do is when you put these glasses on, they can start to recognize and understand things that are surrounding you. And I don't believe that uh, we need to start learning new waving gestures, but what we actually have here is a tap, topple tap, and scroll. So you can easily use the user interface just like it would be a mouse. And of course, you support it with the wireless, smart, artificial intelligence assistant. So, <clears throat> what we have done at Frosmo is we built a demo application also based on this idea. Unfortunately, Apple refused us to send us the latest version of their glasses demo, so we needed to use Microsoft HoloLens. It's a little bit clunky, but hopefully it gives you the idea. So, Imagine yourself that you're at work or at home and you build a shopping list for yourself. Maybe you have a family, big family, and you need lots of stuff, and of course you're thinking about the future of UX all the time, so you need to make it as simple as possible. You go to the massive supermarket, you have your glasses on, and it tell, recognizes you're at the supermarket, and it has the shopping list there hovering at the front of you and it will direct you to the products inside the supermarket with arrows. So telling you, turn left here, turn right there, etc. And once you pick up the product, you look at it and you put it to the shopping basket, it's automatically removed from the list. And ladies and gentlemen, we have built this also for you to experience at the Frosmo Tech Lab. Please go check it out. And again, big thank to especially Stan.
That's about it for my first presentation of the day. And of course, I know you guys are eager to know how could we actually win the market? How could we do that, achieve that? And I'm going to reveal that at the end of the day, second part of the presentation, just to make sure you guys stick, stick around until that. Before that, I want to remind you guys the change is constant, the only constant. Future is so amazing. This moment we're living right now is so amazing because there are so many new possibilities, so many new business models that we can create that hasn't been explored yet, so many new ways to create user experiences that's never seen before. And that's what I hope Frostmax 17 to be all of us enjoy the day. Thank you.